This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of April 21st, 2024. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 339 and happy Passover to Jewish listeners. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest, I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker, and on the big deal feature, a municipal politician from the Victoria area happened to be in Israel the same day as the Iranian missile and drone attack. My guest is Ian Ward, city councillor in Colwood, B.C., who recounts the tense hours during his trip to meet survivors and visit sites of the October 7th massacre. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. For several hours on April 13th, the world watched and wondered what next for the Middle East and beyond. While Israel's war on the Iran-backed Hamas terrorists continued in Gaza, Iran directly attacked Israel for the first time. The ally of China and Russia fired missiles and drones at the Jewish state to retaliate for Israel's bombing of a consulate in Syria. U.S., U.K., and others successfully helped protect Israel. A municipal politician from the Victoria area just so happened to be in Israel that day. Ian Ward is a councillor in the city of Colwood, and he is my guest this week on the podcast. Ward was in Israel to meet people and visit the sites of the October 7th massacre. Where were you when you heard about the uh, Iran retaliation? I mean, it wasn't a surprise per se. Authorities were expecting something to happen. But then the news came that missiles and uh, one-way drones were heading to Israel. Uh, where were you when you heard that? Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Um, you know, as you you alluded to at the outset, so I was in Israel. Um, I was in Jerusalem initially, um, and uh, we just to provide some context. I think the the feeling on the ground in Israel that day or at that moment was that. Um, really any kind of action that was pending would come by proxies, as you said. Um, the the suspicion really in Israel was that we were going to see a fairly robust attack from Hezbollah in the north, actually. So a lot of um, Israeli military assets were being uh, diverted north at the time. That seemed to be the, the greatest area of concern. So myself, on the day of the Iranian attack, I was actually um, probably the worst place I could be over by the Dead Sea, um, we had traveled over there um, earlier that day um, to visit the the historical fortress of Masada and, and the Dead Sea, um, which, as, as we ended up knowing, was sort of um, ground zero for falling debris and, and rockets and missiles and things. So had traveled back uh, through the West Bank and East Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem, and then uh, we're en route to Tel Aviv when uh, the the word came that, uh, in fact, Iran proper had launched uh, its first wave of missiles and uh, and cruise miss or um, pardon me, suicide drones. Now I, I sent you a, a, a direct message uh, at the time to find out how you were, and you, you mentioned you were in your hotel, but the hotel had made arrangements in case people needed to hide. So talk about what kind of system that is in, in that hotel, and if that's common in Israel. It is indeed very common, and uh, it provides a measure of comfort to those who are there. The, the construction in, in Tel Aviv in particular, the more you know, obviously modern city, um, the core of all high-rise buildings is reinforced concrete. Um, I have a photo, actually, I could send you that... Uh, you know, they, they build what amounts to a, a giant, you know, 15 to 25 story concrete bunker in the sky, you know, beyond just the core sort of elevator um, structure that you would see here in Canada. So they build a larger scale um, concrete core and then build the, the additional floors around that. So all of these buildings are safe. Um, at almost every level or, or safe to a certain degree. So, you know, there was signage uh, placed in advance, uh, you know, and how to get to the safe areas, where to go, um, you know, and uh, and it, it was very, very well thought out. And, you know, all the way from, from construction design to, you know, in the moment, there's signage everywhere. And it's something common in Israel. I mean, depending on how close you get to the... Um, 
the border with uh, disputed areas, you know, you you start to see concrete structures on the roadside and so on. So it was very obvious where to go, and uh, and that's what we did. We we moved into uh, a safe area with you know three feet thick concrete walls, and uh, you know waited to to see what would happen. How, how many people were with you at the time, and in, in what essentially is a bomb shelter, uh, and what what did it have water? Uh, heating, air conditioning. What what uh, is the facility like? Yeah, I was with about ten people at the time, and um, yeah, we went down to the ground level um, to to the shelter area there, which um, you know, well equipped. There, there certainly weren't lacking for anything. There was you know, running water and um, you know, uh, tables and chairs, and and you know, that had been supplied with um, with some food, you know, cliff bars and things like that. So. You know, in terms of comforts, you know, not the same as sitting in a luxury hotel room uh, or on the beach, but, uh, you know, from a comfort standpoint, um, you know, there were no concerns. I think really the the concern was, of course, OK, what um, what scale is this attack? You know, how are the, the defense um, mechanisms going to hold? And, uh, you know, will there be additional layers? You know, we said there was a first wave of, of missiles and suicide drones, and then it was announced that there was a second wave coming in. Uh, and the thought then was, OK, is this a precursor to you know, a land war in the north and other things that, um, you know, that we would see it escalate. So, you know, any concerns were less about creature comforts and more about, okay, what's what's coming next? Did you uh, have in the, in the bomb shelter any radio, TV, uh, internet service to keep a tr track of what was going on in the outside world? Yeah, we were monitoring it by... Um, by social media, you know, Twitter feeds and um, and local news and uh, you know Israel is is very communicative. They have an alert system. So I was with some local folks from Israel who um, you know receive on their cell phones uh, regular updates and reminders and, and alerts and things like that. So they have a, a local system. There's apps that that relay that information. So in terms of access to information, it was fairly plentiful. Um, but that was the the main source of information for us. And. Uh... Tell me when you got the the all clear to return back to your room and to to leave the shelter. Oh, that was uh, the wee hours of the morning. Um, you know, I, the challenge in in when we got to Tel Aviv and, and when we sheltered there is that um, you know incoming uh, missiles and, and drones of that variety can take hours to to reach the the coast of Israel. So you know that was kind of midnight ish. I mean, it was about four a.m. before there was a, a degree of comfort that okay, you're safe to to return to your room and catch a few hours of sleep. Um, so it you know it lasted for hours because you know we we could obviously see in real time that um, you know Israeli defense forces, the Iron Dome, uh, you know allies from the United States, Saudi Arabia, Jordan had all engaged these targets and were shooting them down. Um, so it was it was nice to see that, but you know you didn't have that degree of comfort until the attack was kind of you know all said and done, and and you know that was about four a.m. local, if I remember rightly. Were you able to res to resume uh, your your regular itinerary in the trip? There was a, a sense of uncertainty, really, about okay, like again, is this a precursor to something else? I mean, I suspected, as did many, that this was you know just Iran's way of of retaliating for the assassination of of a general earlier, um, and you know that they they had wanted to put on a show of force probably to appease their own people you know and in the arab world force is is power and uh they had to save face so i wasn't overly concerned that anything was imminent i think the greatest concern was that you know will israel will the the more extreme right-wing folks in the Likud party and others that support netanyahu um will they be successful in persuading him to launch a, a counterattack and from a visitor standpoint, the concern was, okay, will the airspace open up? Um, if there's a counterattack, you know, it, it could be weeks before you're able to exit the country. Um, Air Canada had canceled all the flights um, in and out of the country for for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, there was no way to book anything out for for a number of days. Um, so the concern then became, okay, how do we get out of here? If this thing's going to escalate, you know, how do we get home? Because uh, there was no clear path at that point. You tweeted out some of the photos of some of the striking images uh, that, that you saw. One of them was a uh, hostages square, um, a long table symbolically, and also hopefully that people can uh, sit there and enjoy a meal someday. The people specifically are the hostages taken October 7th. Nobody knows where they are and what their condition is. Uh, people are still praying for their safe return. Uh, Hamas is, yeah, continue to operate as a terrorist group in, in Gaza, where the people of Gaza, of course, are living a, a horrible existence. Tell me about going to the square there and what you saw and if you talked to any people there. 
Yeah, I think hostage swear was, um, you know, was interesting and it, it kind of put a bow on the whole experience. Um, you know, we may get into it, but certainly I'd visited some key sites, some, you know, keep it seen that had been attacked, um, you know, the Nova Festival and other places. So, you know, hostage square is is an ongoing thing in, in Israel. It's kind of a permanent uh, place now where the families of hostages gather every weekend. Many Israelis come together every weekend for large um, kind of rallies in support of the hostages. And, you know, the numbers are, are incredible. When you see that long table, you know, there's 134 seats at that table right now. And that's 134 people, you know, men, women and children that that still are held somewhere in Gaza, uh, many of whom, unfortunately, I suspect no longer, uh, you know, are, are drawing breath. Um, but, you know, there is a sense of optimism that, that people want their their family members and loved ones home, of course. Um, and a lot of frustration from from people there that, um, you know, that a hostage deal hasn't, um, you know, been able to come to fruition and, and concerns that, you know, Hamas has alluded to the fact that they, they can't scrape together 40 people that, that fit a description from the, the latest sort of proposed talks that came from the U.S. Um, but, you know, it's, it's powerful when you walk around there, Bob, and you see, you know, the faces and the names, but you see personal items and messages from friends and family and loved ones and, you know, photographs from happier times. And, and you realize that um, politics aside and, and, you know, the conflict aside, these, these were just, you know, innocent people going about their, their daily life in most cases. They were, you know, young people in their 20s at a music festival. They were people in their homes preparing breakfast or just waking up for the morning, making coffee. Um, many of them were, um, you know, because of their proximity to, to Gaza, were peace activists. And interestingly are, are probably the furthest left-leaning folks you'll find in Israel in terms of their um, political stance around making peace and finding a two-state solution. These people were very much allies to to the people in the Gaza envelope. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's so incredibly um, moving when you just see, you know, these images and, and, and talk to people who, who knew them and are, are there waiting and hoping for their return. Now, the, the site of the Nova Music Festival, uh, your photo there showed how the f photographs of the victims are, are displayed there in, in a kind of a makeshift memorial to remember those who uh, who were there, just in, young people enjoying life, enjoying music, uh, enjoying the weather on a Jewish holiday and uh, never made it home. And, and those that did leave uh, left with uh, scars, both physical and mental. Yeah, the the Nova Festival site is is just incredibly moving. I mean, it's you know you you look at it, you think it could be anywhere here in, in Canada, just a big open um, kind of regional park area where you know it was just a, an electronic music festival for people to gather and have a good time and camp. And um, there's two sections to it. There's there's the section you speak of where there's photos of um, of the victims there, you know, mounted prominently on on kind of sticks, and it's as you walk through, and there's lots of tributes to them and notes from friends and family and so on, and and that's you know, this is sort of the makeshift memorial that sprung up in the core area where, where many of them lost their lives. But there's another area very close to it where many were gunned down, um, you know, at the, the outset of the attack, you know, when they were caught by surprise, no one really knew what was going on. And in that area where, where each person fell, um, they planted a tree, you know, with a, a kind of a note and, and reminders and, and candles and things that speak about who they are. And, you know, it's, it's impressive and also kind of daunting to see just the sheer number of trees planted in this, this open area. Um, you know, it, it's nice to see that new growth and, and sort of life springing from the ground. But at the same time, you realize that this, this small, what eventually will be a small forest represents, you know, 330 some odd people whose lives were cut short there. So it, um, yeah, it's, it's a very moving place. And as you alluded to, I, I suspect that Israel, you know, long term, we'll have plans to turn this into sort of a national park or, or you know, memorial of, of some kind. Um, it's already treated as such. And, and I think it's inevitable that, uh, that, you know, it will become something like that in future as to what exactly it'll look like. We don't know. But uh, like I say, those trees are there and there, there's permanence with those. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the, the other parts of the memorial will, will become something greater. How close did you get to, to the border with Gaza and were you able to see or hear anything? Yeah, we um, actually, I was originally scheduled to go to the border crossing um, at, the, at the, the southernmost border crossing where aid's flowing across, but there was a mortar attack as we were on our way there, so we had to turn around. Um, the closest I got was outside you know, to the west of the town of Starot. Uh, Starot was one of the, the cities that was overrun by Hamas um, on October 7th, so we got to the 
the edge of the the road and the fields that lie adjacent to to Gaza. Um, from there, from this sort of higher ground, you can see very clearly into the the northernmost um, areas of of Gaza. What used to be the village of Beit Hanun, um, which is right in sort of the top corner, the the northeastern corner of Gaza. Um, and beyond that, Jabalia, which is a larger city area. So Bayat Hanun has kind of been removed from the map at this point. Um, from Bayat Hanun is, is where, you know, hundreds of Hamas fighters had, had breached the wall um, and come through and, and massacred folks uh, along there. So that that town doesn't exist anymore. But beyond it, you can see Jabalia. And, and you know, while it was there, you could hear Israeli artillery and, you know, and see the odd airstrike happening in, in an area that really now is devoid of civilians. Um, but still harbors Hamas fighters kind of hiding amidst the ruins and, you know, and, and being sort of, um, you know, sought out by by the IDF. What is the mood of the, the Israelis that you met through wherever you went? Are, are they getting impatient with Net Netanyahu, for instance? That's a really good question, uh, Bob. I, I think there is an element of frustration, I think, with Netanyahu specifically. You know, we know prior to October 7th, you know, he was already facing, um, you know, some some pushback from from Israelis. So, you know, he wasn't necessarily beloved to begin with. Um, I think the frustration, though, has been, you know, initially after the attack, much like, you know, in North America after 9-11, you know, people coalesce around their leadership and just want an effective united response. And, you know, I think now that's gradually turning into some frustration there that there is no plan for, they call it the day after, you know, what, what does victory look like? And what happens next? And that hasn't been clearly articulated. And I think that's the the greatest source of frustration for Israelis is, is what does the day after look like? That's a reference that I heard often when I was there. Um, you know, there is frustration that that this incursion into Gaza hasn't been managed effectively. There's a lot of people that thought the first thing they should have done is, is you know, take over the, the Philadelphia corridor along the Egyptian border, you know, end um, the ability to smuggle weapons and things through there, you know, temporarily occupy Gaza and and really seek Arab participation. I think everyone is united there in the belief that, you know, the West isn't going to decide this. Israel can't unilaterally just take over Gaza. There's no desire to reoccupy Gaza long term by anybody. Um, I would say on both sides of the political spectrum. I think there's a consensus that uh, the only way forward has to be with the support of the international community and with Arab nations to to really lead the way, like in terms of a peacekeeping force in Gaza or in southern Lebanon, that you need Saudi Arabia, you need Jordan, you know, you need uh, the, these Arab partners to to play a, an integral role. Um, we, you know, we saw that they came to Israel's defense uh, on the 13th in the air attack, but, uh, you know, we need more than that. Um, and there's frustration also at the, you know, those like Iran, obviously, who's, who's funding terror there, um, Qatar, who sort of Man, but yet they harbor the leadership of Hamas and Qatar and, and Qatari funds not only funnel into into Gaza and support terrorism, but you know there's there's a lot of suspicion and, and belief and evidence that they they Qatari funds are in North America and Canada, you know supporting some of this alleged pro Palestine movement, which which in many ways has now morphed into you know saying the quiet things in the open, you know from the river to the sea and, and we are Hamas. I mean that's being chanted on our streets right now. So so Israel's frustrated. I think a lot of people there feel kind of ostracized, um, shunned by the international community. There's that cynicism that you know just like at the UN, Israel will always lose. That you know the the propaganda war is going to turn against them no matter what happens here. Um, and I think Bob, it's important for me to mention that. You don't find a person in Israel right now who isn't in some way touched by this war. Um, we can't underestimate 10-7. You know, here the media narrative has moved on to talk about, you know, what's happening in Gaza and other things. But what they call 10-7, you know, that's their 9-11 or worse. And everybody I talk to, you know, you talk to a bus driver or, you know, a tour guide or a restaurant worker, anybody has, you know, a brother, sister, son, daughter, somebody in the IDF and the reserves who is either fighting now or is being called up. You have people who have schoolmates who died. You know, I talked to a young man in his 20s who has been to 16 funerals since 10-7. Um, 16 people in their 20s that that have lost their lives either on October 7th or subsequent to that, you know, in the IDF. And, you know, as a young guy who, who actually is an agricultural student who just wants to work on the farm and, you know, do research and whose life, life has been so immensely changed by by what happened on October 7th. And I think they're still grieving for that. You know, this isn't PTSD. They're in the midst of trauma. And, you know, while the rest of us are moving on and talking about kind of future states and things, they're they're still coming to terms with with what happened on that day. 
Um, and I think that's the most important takeaway is that this is raw and very visceral and real for them right now. After making the trip, coming home, processing it, uh, the experience that you went through during the, the Iran attack, what would you say to uh, politicians in Victoria, um, not only your fellow municipal politicians, but the provincial politicians? What would you say to members of parliament? What would you say to the public about the state of, of the Middle East right now and, and what Canadians should be doing and saying and thinking? For me, I, I share in the frustration that I felt from Israelis when I'm back home here in Canada and I see what's happening on our campuses and on our streets. And and I would say to people to to stop buying into the propaganda, you know, open your eyes, like research it, understand the the situation there, stop allowing this false, you know, settler colonialism narrative, you know, trying to tie indigenous relations here to indigenous situations there. You know, I mean, Israelis, like the Jews have been in that area for thousands of years. This is not the same. Um, and I think that's the biggest frustration for me is that, you know, anti-Semitism is, there's always an undercurrent of it, but it's it's really out there on the surface now where, you know, we're, we're seeing it in, in every element of life. I mean, we had politicians at the highest levels that, that didn't say a word on October 7th, but now happily, you know, wear kefias into the House of Commons and chatter about, um, you know, how we should be defunding uh you know, Israel and things like that. And I think at the end of the day, Israel is a liberal democracy. The, the other thing I have to mention to people here is that this notion of being an apartheid state, is just asinine. It's ridiculous, Bob. You walk around Israel and, you know, I, I, I joke, but I, I chatted with this guy who's a, asked him about a, where, where to go to get a really good shawarma. And, you know, here's a, a an Israeli Jew telling me to go visit his, um, you know, his Palestinian Arab friend who owns a, a shop in the Christian quarter of Jerusalem. I mean, that's the multicultural kind of environment that you're in. Um, you know, in the north, the, the population is majority Arab in, in northern Israel, for example. So, you know, the, there's there's faces of all colors and, and, and religions and things uh, you know, across Israel. This is not a white versus brown scenario as it's made out to be here. And I think there's a lot of naive people here in my less polite moments, I call them useful idiots. And, and I think we, we really need some of these folks to wake up and start stop parroting this narrative. And we need politicians to, frankly, grow a spine, uh, particularly on the left. Um, I see this Venn diagram now where the far right and the far left overlap. And, and you know, neither side's impressive. But, you know, when when you're joining a particular group in, in open hatred, uh, you know, of religious and, and cultural and identity in the Jews, you know, you know, you've got a problem. Thanks again for joining us on the podcast, uh, Ian Ward. He's a councillor from the city of Colwood on Vancouver Island uh, in the capital regional district of uh, Victoria, close to the capital city of British Columbia. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. News podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In the Taiwan news, Taiwan's Taroko National Park will cost 1 billion new Taiwan dollars, or $42 million Canadian, to rebuild after quake. Trails and facilities within Taroko National Park suffered severe damage in the magnitude 7.2 earthquake this month. The reconstruction of Provincial Highway No. 8 will take time, and the ministry will allocate budgets annually. However, as the disaster area is still experiencing aftershocks, a detailed assessment cannot be conducted until the situation stabilizes. In Kyoto News, I knew lose legal battle over right to catch salmon in northern Japan. The Sapporo District Court on Thursday rejected a demand by a group of Ainu indigenous people to be recognized as exempt from a ban on commercial salmon fishing in a river, arguing they had inherited this right from their ancestors. The lawsuit marked the first instance where the Ainu people sought recognition of their indigenous rights from both the central and Hokkaido governments. In the Hong Kong Free Press, Hong Kong spent over 1.2 billion Hong Kong dollars, or 211 million Canadian dollars, on first Patriots-only local election, marked by record low turnout. Last year's district court election, the first held under an overhauled system that slashed democratic representation, saw a record low turnout. The sum works out to just 1,000 Hong Kong dollars spent for each of the 1.2 million voters. The Bureau said it had, quote, fully mobilized resources to promote the election through, quote, creative publicity means, including holding the, quote, Night Vibes District Council election and the, quote, 
District Council Election Fun Day. That's around the rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Now it's time on the Breaker.News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. In Willamette Week, Portland's iconic Elvis impersonator faces eviction in June. The Rip City King has been evicted from his home of 22 years. Local legend John Schroeder described his landlord, Ruth Collier, as a surrogate grandmother, but she died in 2021 and her daughter gave him notice in March and now he is looking for an affordable place to live. In the Washington State Standard, struggling state ferry system finds its way in Washington governor's race. Washington's front-running Democratic candidate for governor is embracing a Republican idea that would hasten building of new ferries and slow the state's push to electrify the fleet. Attorney General Bob Ferguson says he supports constructing two diesel-powered vessels if this is the fastest solution to adding boats needed to boost reliability of service amid the ongoing threat of cancellations when an existing vessel breaks down. In The Times Colonist, transfer of Nanaimo House to Sun likely intended to avoid paying damage award court fines. After John He was awarded 447450 in damages for assault after a civil trial against Hai Wang, whose lawyer discovered Huang's house had been transferred to his son for $1. The house was valued at $485,000 at the time. The decision said it is currently assessed at more than $980,000. The transfer took place after the civil assault case was filed and before a verdict was rendered. That's Cascadia calling on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo Bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to authors and publishers of books in British Columbia and about British Columbia, because April 23rd is BC Book Day. Buy a BC book. You can nominate someone for a virtual Dynamo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, custom homes and renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of April 21st, 2024. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on the 21st of April in 1962, Seattle's 21st Century Exposition World's Fair opened? The first World's Fair in the U.S. since World War II. The legacy is the Seattle Center campus, home of the Space Needle. Now you know. Send me your feedback. Send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the free email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. Or follow the Breaker News on Twitter, now known as X, for news as it happens. And you can support the Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to patreon.com slash thebreakernews. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash thebreakernews. Until next week.